So it's been a hot minute since I did a Q&A video. Uh, weirdly, one of the things I wanted to announce was the Q&A video was probably going to start going bi-monthly or quarterly, which is great because this is March in I'm doing February's video. Anyway, um, lots of stuff has happened. Uh, if you remember the Discord, you kind of get your head around why this is so late. If not, let me enlighten you. COVID has been in the house, so that's been a thing. And suddenly we found combustible gas in the house. Um, so, which, so it turns out we had a gas leak, which is pretty serious news. Gas company came and shut off our supply, which basically meant no heating and no way to cook food on top of the hob. We still have an electric cooker, but no way to like heat pans outside of a camping sort of electric uh, heat pad, uh, heat pad, heat plate. Um, so Q seven to 10 days of us being miserable and not wanting to do anything because it was freezing all the time and just huddling in blankets. Um, and then everything kind of resolved itself, but that means loads of stuff has been sort of like pushed back and pushed back. So this is why this is so late. So my apologies for that. I'm genuinely really sorry about that. But I do have some good questions for you. Starting with Focal Horizon 899 asks, I don't want to just ask what your favorite game of all time is because it seems like a boring question. So I'm going to break it down. Break it down for me. What is your favorite AAA game of all time? What's your favorite AA game of all time? And what is your favorite indie game of all time? Oh, man, I should have vetted these first. That's really hard. Um, I think... God, that's that's a really good question, Simon. Um, Simon obviously has known me for a long time. Uh, he was a writer, a staff writer at SlimGamer.com. Um, as I explained last time, don't go to that website anymore. It's garbage. But when we were working there, when the OG team was there, it was great. And I played a lot of games. God, I've played a lot of games. Um... All right, I, I'm going to go with my gut on this. As some games popped to the top of my brain, and and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with those and try and defend them in my own head, if that makes sense. Triple A games, probably the Mass Effect series. Now I'm probably going to get some some backlash for that, but that that at that time when I played it, that felt like the most cinematic experience. I'd probably ever played even better than Dragon Age and I'm a I'm a fantasy boy I he says pointing at all the fantasy maps behind him and all the D&D tarot cards and all the Baldur's Gate maps to his left um but uh I and I love Dragon Age I Dragon Age 2 was a thing and you know Dragon Age Inquisition I adored Dragon Age was, was great but it never quite scratched the itch of it being sort of this flowing trilogy of games. And Mass Effect really did. Uh, and I've got a lot of memories of it. I've got a lot of memories of it because Mass Effect 2 and 3, I helped do the release reviews for it um, for the respective places I worked at. And... In Mass Effect 2, I was playing when I injured my spine, um, and that was the first stepping stone on the road to being diagnosed with degenerative disc disease. So that's, you know, that's a that's a core memory in there. And a lot of people kind of don't like Mass Effect 2 because it introduced some new stuff, like the planet scanning and the, you know, uh, driving around on the moons more and stuff like that. I really enjoyed that. You have to remember, when I played it, I played it over a weekend to review it. And when I say a weekend, I mean I got it on the Friday afternoon. Friday afternoon after work, I started it. I did not stop playing it until about midnight on Sunday because I had work on Monday. And non-game related work. So I couldn't even I couldn't even use, you know, oh, Mass Effect 2 release as an excuse for being tired or not being in. It was a case of uh, do the day job. No, no questions asked. So, yeah, it was a bit weird i really enjoyed those aspects that people seem to hate because it broke up the almost monotony of constant cinematic action but i really like the three games 
felt like that character's journey. I mean, I always went with stock Shepherd, if that makes sense, the stock character. Um, I didn't customize them or make them look different or anything like that. And it kind of felt by the end of it that I'd been on a on a journey. You know, I knew these characters. I was upset if and when they died. Actually, there's a very, very specific point as to why I think Mass Effect 2 might be my favorite of all time. Suicide mission. That can go horrendously wrong if you're not prepared. But if you get it just right, it is perfect. You've got um, the the geth that you, you uh, kind of recruit crawling through their vents. You've got Jack with the or the bionic powers like deflecting all the all the bad stuff and yeah you've got Morden doing his scientist bit and god Morden was a good character um and yeah yeah mass effect 3 Morden's line you know if not me it might someone if i didn't do it someone else might have gotten it wrong one of his final lines that was heartbreaking and I just think there's a lot of moments like that where I'm like, that was, do you remember when, you know when you watch a fantastic TV series? Like, it's like that. It was the fantastic TV series of video games for me at that time. And I can't think of any others that sort of spring to mind. And that, that includes like Dark Souls, Elden Ring, uh, big Final Fantasy VII original, that sort of thing. Yeah, they were, they were great. But that, Mass Effect 2 really sticks out. So yeah, probably Mass Effect 2. Weird as though that may seem. It feels like I've just sort of discovered that myself about, about what I wanted. Um, oh, double A titles. Does, does Mortal Kombat count as a double A title? Um, does Mortal Kombat... Uh, is it Deception? Mortal Kombat Deception? Going with Puzzle Combat in. I love that, like properly love that. And uh, again, for, for uh, memory related reasons, I love it because it reminds me of my wife and I, when we weren't married, we were boyfriend and girlfriend. Um, we moved in together in our own flat for the first time, mega exciting. And we would sit, eat Domino's pizza and play Mortal Kombat Deception, puzzle combat. and. My wife would kick my ass at it because she's well smart. She's proper brainy. So she could just do it. Like I was just I was fumbling fumbling with my thumbs at that point and she she just annihilated me at it. Um so I, yeah, as weird as that might sound, double A titles are a bit of a difficult one though, because as well you know Simon who asked the question, but maybe some people who are watching it as well. Double A video game titles have a tendency of being rubbish. And that's nothing nothing against who makes them, but they're double A for a reason. Like they don't have the budget, they don't have the talent, they don't have the backing, etc. Um Yeah, there's a reason they don't they don't quite reach triple A standard. Um and that's one of the reasons uh well I mean Mortal Kombat Deception as a game is pretty weak. But Puzzle Combat, whew, excellent stuff. Um, indie games. God, oh, I've played a lot of indie games. Um, uh, um, I don't... There is a game I'm thinking of, but it's really recent, so it kind of feels like a cop-out. But... Tunic is is coming back to me. I wanted to say Death's Door, but and that's fun. Don't get me wrong, that, that's an enjoyable game. But Tunic really surprised me recently in regards to um, just how intricate some of those puzzles are and how accidentally intricate they can be as well. So there's a moment in Tunic where, uh, and I've I've drafted a review for Tunic so it may come out at some point, I'm not 100% sure but I've drafted a review where basically I say um, the first third of the game is your generic isometric adventure game so slightly side on top down view, uh, a little bit like a Zelda game, like you'll, you'll just go around you'll, you'll collect some coins, you'll beat a boss you'll get a shiny um, and you'll progress the story and then obviously you know, a twist happens and some stuff happens but as you're going through it, you sort of pick up these collectibles in the form of instruction manual pages, and you, you've got a choice here. You can either kind of ignore it completely and kind of bimble your way through the game to an extent, 
until they really matter. Or you can sort of scratch the surface a little bit and when you scratch the surface a little bit of these puzzles, you realize actually this isn't just a dumb collectible. These are intricate parts of this story for a reason. Uh, for a, a very simple cartoon-esque game, it tells quite an quite a obscure and bleak story. Um, the fox in Tunic, the, 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 the character that you, uh, you, you play as, can't read these instruction manual pages. They're in a different language because the world's not made for you as a player. You, you don't belong there. You're an invader almost. Um, that's not a spoiler. That's just, that's, I'm just sort of inferring that. Um, but th you get this impression that you are trying to decipher your way through these pages and decipher your way. What does what? What does this item do? What does that? Why are people speaking a different language? Why are these signposts in a different language? All this sort of stuff. And it becomes very apparent. It's actually the only game of recent notes. The last one being probably Morrowind. Um, oh, no, that's not necessarily true. The last one being, is it After after Dark, After Fall? The uh, uh, Mist and Riven-esque uh, horror games about the... Uh, puzzle horror games about the great British railway system. <laughs> Such a random niche comment there. Such a niche bit there. But I played them all on stream when I was a member of the Godcom channel. Then I had to write down notes. But that's the first game, Tunic, in a very long time um, that has made me crack out a notepad and pen in order to solve some puzzles. And that's saying something. Because normally, like, that includes Elden Ring. I was making notes on stuff like Elden Ring and uh, Breath of the Wild and stuff like that. And in regards to, you know, where stuff was, I was just noting stuff down on my phone or things like that. But this is the first one. I had to get an actual piece of paper and start jotting stuff down and be like, what does this mean? Does this mean this? Does this mean this? All this sort of stuff, like a conspiracy theorist-esque pegboard with like bits of string going left, right and center. That was, that was wonderful. I genuinely, genuinely loved that. So if I could give peripheral media or peripheral mic awards to three games of best indie double-A, triple-A game. It'd be indie, tunic, double-A, Mortal Kombat Deception, triple-A, Mass Effect 2. There you go. Hopefully that answers your question. I don't think that's going to be the answer you're thinking of, but hopefully that answers your question. Um, Focalorizing899 also asks, can we get a tour of your gaming room? Sure, why not? So here's how this is going to work. Now, because of the way the room is laid out, both my wife and I use it for separate purposes. So you're going to get to see the bit that I use for content creation. You won't get to see the bit that she uses for her purposes. So here goes. So as we go in the room, this is where all the content stuff is made. So this is literally where you were a second ago. You can see me on that screen right there. Hello. Hi, yeah, you all right? Uh, very quick, briefly, uh, one's my work camera, one's my streaming camera, but you can't guess which one's which. Um, so this is the desk. It's quite funny that Echo uh, mentioned in the last um, Q&A video, am I ever fully pleased with my setup? No, because I always want something new. My point exactly. Hence why this is probably going to change in the very near future. Um, so I'm going to go just around here. So if I block off the bit that you see behind me is this shelf of plushies. Each of one has a distinct uh, reason for being there. This is Daffodil from Spirit Spiritfarer. Obviously the Mimic with the Minsk and Boo uh, still boxed figurine that I'm yet to put together and paint. Which I'm really hoping to do one day. Uh, we've got uh, Conifer from uh, Hollow Knight because Hollow Knight was my 20, 2021 Christmas game, I think it was. I played it over Christmas and really enjoyed it. Absolutely obsessed with it. Um, and obviously Crypt of the Necrodance, we've got Freddy Merchantry here. We've got the Everyone is Awesome um, uh, Pride Lego. Uh, on the wall, back up a little bit, we've got a number of maps and pictures. So we've got this one is the Icewind Dale map. From the PC game. I just close the door a little bit. This one's from Diablo 3, which was a gift from my current work manager. Uh, this one's Talisman from the Talisman RPG. This one is the Shivering Isles from the uh, the, the PC game. 
the Morrowind, the Shivering Isles expansion. This one's my favorite. This one's the Silent Hill one from the Konami store and I absolutely adore it. Um, even though, like, I think I mentioned this. It's got fake damp, but it looks really real. Uh, this one is uh, Morrowind. I think that one's Morrowind. Oblivion, that one's from Oblivion. This one's from Dragon Age Origins. This is the cloth for Elden map. Uh, this is a picture of the, the character from Hollow Knight um, that my wife drew me. That's actually her drawing, which is very impressive. You can see there, that was one of my Christmas gifts a couple of years ago. Then we've got a map of Stardew Valley. I'm big into maps, as you might be able to tell. I got some, recently got some acoustic panels stuck around the edge to go with the acoustic panels on the ceiling as well. And also down the wall, which is why my audio doesn't suck as much. Uh, I've got the standing desk. This does need some cable management underneath. Um, we're not gonna go too far under there for obvious reasons. On here, we've got the um, uh, tarot cards, the D&D tarot cards. You can see some of the examples here, which I really, really like. Love all of these. Found these in Forbidden Planet in Nottingham. Uh, these I got, genuinely, I've collected these from three different cities. They're all by the same artist, um, but I I've, I've, can't find them all in one place. But these are the three covers for the three rule books for D&D. We've got another picture for D&D, which is somebody stealing um, Xanathar's fish. <laughs> Presumably that character has a name who uh, is stealing them. He looks terrified as he should be. I'm gonna call him Selsig. We've got uh, Dol from Bloodborne. We've got Yarnum from Bloodborne, a wooden D20 stuck on the wall. Up there in the sticks, we've got Baldur's Gate 2, Baldur's Gate 1 and Tides of Numeria, or N Numenaria, Numeria, Numenor. I don't know how to say it. Um, so that's those three limited edition maps up there as well. We've also got the all important acoustic panels on the door for when I'm playing D&D and screaming my head off at VR. This closes. Fortunately, it's got this in, so it doesn't smash any cattails. Um, and it's kind of, well, we've got the, the big stack of stuff here. Give you a bit of an overview. I've got all the D&D &D books and really old games here. Let's get down here. Really old games here. I've got Batman on the Amiga. I think that's got the original floppy disk in it. Let's have a look. Yeah, floppy disks. I'm, I'm physical save icon old. Uh, I'm also games on tape old. This is how old I am. Games on tape old. Dizzy Games on Tape. Magic Land Dizzy on the Amstrad. Put that away in a minute. Uh, so we've got some old big box PC games down here. Um, we've got some cartridges as well for the SNES. We've got, that's actually my file server behind there. Let's not look too closely at that. It works at the minute. Got some boxed Mega Drive games. We've got some soundtracks behind the Lego head. They're all important. Some CD soundtracks, which I really like. Uh, the Turrican Special Edition from Strictly Limited Games, which I'm uh, a big fan of. All of my D&D um, &D books. Next shelf, we've got GameCube games. Um, uh, <laughs> well, forgotten the name of the Evercade, Evercade games. We've got old generation games, which is Xbox and Xbox 360, N64 games, and Mega Drive cartridges. We've got the lovely uh, Oculus Quest chargers, which is a lifesaver. Um, Oculus Quest with now with 100% more googly eyes. Oh, and moving up, we've got the PlayStation 2 collection, which is now taking up too much space. The PlayStation 1 collection, which is now taking up too much space. Uh, my robot dog from work. That's a work thing because I work with machines and AI and robots. Um, we also have the Axiom Verge statue that I got from um, Indie Box ages ago. Moving up, we've got the N64, the PlayStation 2, the PlayStation 1, Monstro that my wife made me years and years and years ago from Binding of Isaac. We've got an oil diffuser if you want to get stressed out. We've got some lighting. We've got some Lego. Um, what else have we got? Oh, we've got the um, analog uh, consoles. We've got the Mega Drive here and the SNES. 
For the GameCube, we've got a, a automatic keyboard duster, which is a godsend, because I don't remember the last time I bought canned air. Um, oh, these are interesting. So these are my parents' original D&D figures. So this is a cool thing. So I think this was my dad, this dwarf here, and this was my mum, I think. And they used to play Dungeons and Dragons uh, with my uncle and some of his friends. So I inherited those when my dad passed away. Um, got a great little beholder here. He lights up, but he doesn't have any batteries. Uh, a ghastly. The summoning bell from Bloodborne because I got the special edition of Bloodborne. What else we got? This is proper shaky cam stuff. This uh, we've got the VR, the great VR cable, which I need to plug back in. We've got my Silent Hill Tacoma Lake hat. Oh, I nearly forgot my uh, Phasmo King hat. Um, got my uh, Mass Effect Two. Oh no, my crown! How dare I? There we go. Uh, I've got my Mass Effect Two hat, my Joker hat that took me years to find. Got some Lego pieces behind the light. Let me just turn the light off a second. Got some light up Lego. Oop. Venom, Carnage, and a ship in a bottle. This did have lights, but one of the wires broke, so I need to replace it. I just haven't done. Uh, we've also got Flowey from Undertale. Magikarp, because it took me if, it took me years to find a Magikarp. Magikarp is my favorite Pokemon. Without a shadow of a doubt, he's my favorite Pokemon. And I'll never... I'll never forget that my wife got me this <laughs> as, a, as a birthday present. And I've always appreciated it. Uh, also, the first bit of actual game swag I ever got was a model of the Normandy from Mass Effect. So that was pretty cool. Um, I've got some various camera bits and bobs. Another desk mat down there. Let's not look too deeply down the back of my desk. Um, some special pin badges from different events where I've been to like tech events or gaming events and stuff like that. And I think that might be it. Uh, yeah, so here we've got the content set up. So as I'm sat here, I've got my Mac Mini here. I've got my work Mac here. And I've got my PC here. So the work Mac and the Mac Mini and the PC are all down in this corner. Um, I use this microphone for like unboxings and stuff like that. I'll use my headset mic when I'm streaming, because that's better. That's the pad that Phoenix will sleep on when he's bored. There's some camera equipment down there, as well as some uh, more Lego that needs to be created. There's a Bowser down there, and also a Super Mario block. Um, what you can't see, because the monitor's in the way, is my GoXLR. So everything goes through my GoXLR, and then I've got this Sound Blaster card here that lets me boost my audio so I can hear it a little bit better. I've got my... Um, Shuttle Express here, which helps me video edit. I've got my Stream Deck. I've got my uh, the Time Cube, which everyone seemed really impressed at because ADHD and focus blocks and being able to limit myself to, oh, I'm going to do this for 30 minutes. And I just twist that and then it will just time me for so long. And then that will go off and then I'll know I've done something for 30 minutes and that helps. And yeah. That's pretty much it. If I back up a little bit, try not to fall over my wife's stuff. You can kind of see the whole setup here. This is where everything kind of happens. So it is interesting that uh, Echo, Echo Alpha, Peripheral Echo Alpha said recently that, you know, are you ever fully satisfied with the thing? No, because I've already got some uh, updates that I want to make to it. Um, like this. Like that. There you go. See, so I've got a nice VR stool now. Um, I've got two additional monitors. Wasn't that easy? I just clicked my fingers and everything was done. Wow, the internet was right. Just, that was so simple. I don't know why people complain about this sort of thing. Anyway, hope you enjoyed the video. Bye. Well, that was exciting, wasn't it? Uh, moving on, Fleos asks, given that February has the feast day of that old martyr St. Valentine, how did you and your spouse come to be together? Excellent question. Um, and if not answered already in the first part, do you find gaming to be an important part of the relationship? That's a really great question. So first part of that question, how do we come to be together? We met in the only rock slash alternative metal club in Blackpool where I, where I grew up. 
um, and we were both we were met through our respective other halves if that makes sense so we met through sort of other people and there was a moment where I met my wife um, and I kind of I kind of knew I wanted to spend more time with her I knew I wanted to be around her more and within hours I was like I definitely want to spend more time with this with this person and within maybe a few months I was like I definitely I can see myself growing old with this person so <laughs> there was definitely a, a thing there where you realize um, that that's the person you want to be with so uh, the second part of your question is really interesting do you find gaming to be an important part of the relationship short answer no like at all like if gaming were to disappear completely tomorrow and never never exist again I would be pretty crushed um, not only because I do stuff like this, uh, but I, I love gaming, it's part of my DNA, it's part of my bones, it's part of my marrow, that sort of, it's always been there, it's always, always been there. I can date certain events based on what game I was playing, traumatic or otherwise, you know, um, yeah, I can, I can date stuff based on what game I was playing, or I can, uh, uh, relate to emotional feelings I felt when certain characters died, or some stuff like that, uh, which probably says more to my therapist than, than it does to anybody else, but moving swiftly on, um, but my wife, I don't think, would be too bothered. Like, she doesn't game as a hobby, if that makes sense, she doesn't, what we do is we, we kind of have, um, uh, what I would consider to be three groups of games together. We have, uh, well, groups of games. We have the uh, player watcher, so cinematic, basically, with the cinematic games. So if I'm playing a game like, um, let's take Final Fantasy VII, for example, Final Fantasy VII Remake, if I'm playing that, she is invested in watching that unfold so she will sit it will be a couple's thing where i will sit and play and she will watch me play if that makes sense which is great it's like having a live twitch audience it's fantastic um but we also have uh so if there are games that i think are cinematic elden ring for example um I think that's fantastic. I, I like watching people play Elden Ring. Obviously, I like watching people who are good at their game and who are entertaining play Elden Ring. And that's not I'm not always those, if that makes sense. Sometimes I'm a bit crap at a bit of the game, or sometimes it's just a bit boring because I'm just wandering around. That's not entertaining. Um, so my wife won't watch those sort of things. But if it's uh, games like... Um, Ooh, what's another one? Devil May Cry games. Devil May Cry games are easy to play. Uh, they have a very solid story, as simple as you want to say they are. They're a very solid story, um, and they are very cinematic. Uh, and there's always something happening. You're like, go here, kill enemies, go here, kill enemies, go here, do boss, that sort of thing. Boss is big cinematic drop into into boss fight, etc. Um... And then there are the, so those are the cinematic ones. And then there are the, uh, what I would consider to be the um, cozy games. So you've got the cozy games where there are certain aspects of certain games that just kind of relax both of us. Case in point, I've been playing Cozy Grove a lot over the last year um, on Switch. And whenever I play it, I've started playing it last thing at night because whenever I play it, we're both just chill out to it. Like, we, we will just both chill out. Um, uh, prior to it being Cozy Grove, it was, during the lockdown times, it was Animal Crossing New Horizons. Like, yeah, that was everybody's kind of lockdown game. But that was that was the game I played the most. And uh, I played every single day. It was a routine. Played it every day. Did some chores. Did some remodeling. That sort of thing. Uh, <laughs> bought and sold bells. That sort of stuff. There was just this this routine of of kind of going around, voicing the characters as well. That was always fun. Um, and just just doing the dailies, if that makes sense. And doing the dailies and sort of uh, making little incremental progress. And that was a very lo-fi game, which leads me on to another question in a minute. Um, there are co-op games we play. Uh, we played through the entirety of um, the new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game recently. 
which the rest of the title temporarily escapes me, but as soon as my wife figured out that it was a retro e looking game and also it had co-op she was in, uh, we adore playing Gears of War together, um, and she's really good at it. Uh, well, I can't remember what else we, we play as well. Yeah, there are some other games as well, but that's 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 generally it. But the core the the core part of your question is it important to the relationship? Not really. Um, it's a nice thing, don't get me wrong. But that's very, it's very much my hobby, and there are times when it kind of crosses over to both of us. But it's not like you know you see on Reddit like oh his and hers gaming setup. It's never going to happen, but it's and that's totally cool because we've got different interests. Um, also, we do loads of stuff outside of our individual interests together, so that's, yeah, it's not a core part of our of our relationship. I mean, I'm obsessed with it, but my wife understands that I'm obsessed with it, so. Uh, next question, being led quite nicely again by Folk Horizon 899, is, are you planning on bringing back lo-fi gaming? And if so, what games can we expect to see on it? Excellent question. Yes, 100% lo-fi gaming is coming back. So that I want it to change very slightly. Um, in regards to, it's there are going to be lo-fi gaming streams, but lo-fi gaming as a brand, and I don't really like using that word, lo-fi gaming as a brand is going to be pre-recorded um, streams, pre-recorded playthroughs of lo-fi games. But yes, it is. It's not really going away. I just want to repackage it slightly so it's a bit more consumable for everyone. Uh, case in point, um, or one of the key reasons for this, the lo-fi gaming streams do well. The lo-fi gaming playthrough videos do great on YouTube. I mean, to to a factor of like 10 <laughs> so it's really really strange but and that's kind of i like being able to package that together um there's a certain you know if i want to edit anything into it or i want to you know cut the end off or i want to put anything cool in the middle of it, something i don't know if i want to edit it i have the freedom to do that before posting it live whereas if i'm streaming i know i can do that but i don't I don't do that, so I don't make any post-recording edits to streams normally um, before they're just whacked onto YouTube. Uh, so what you see is what you get with the streams. But I will definitely be playing lo-fi gaming streams, but the lo-fi gaming moniker will be purely for, for standalone videos from now on. Oh, and uh, what games can we expect to see? So I've got two lists at the minute. I've got a list of yeses and I've got a list of maybes. Now, I want to be really picky about this. Uh, there's a reason I want to be really picky about this and I can't really go into it yet, if that makes sense. But bear with me. It makes sense when you understand. Um, the yeses are games I've played and I know are lo-fi, what I consider to be lo-fi games. The maybes are games that look lo-fi that might not be lo-fi if that makes sense. So the yeses include things like, they include, but are not limited to, uh, Cozy Grove, uh, Townscaper, The Yarg, Coffee Talk, Flower, Stargy Valley, What Remains of Edith Finch, uh, Everyone's Gone to the Rapture, Spiritfarer, Unpacking, and several others. And then there are the maybes, which is a longer list because I want to go through them. I don't have to complete the game, but I want to be able to play it to the point where I'm like, yes, this is a lo-fi game. Uh, Pilgrims, Alba, Dorf Romantic, Strange Horticulture, which interestingly I did stream for a couple of hours not that long ago. So actually I should move that over to the yes column because that is quite chill and relaxing. And it's got that kind of... Uh, um, uh, management sim-esque feel to it where you don't, you don't really have to be paying you are paying attention but you don't really have to be paying too much attention to it um, things like Brewmaster Witchwood uh, Lemon Cake Beyond the Frame that's all these look really nice from, from various sources I've seen they all look really nice they've got beautiful graphics they've got beautiful soundscapes but I don't know how they play and I don't what I don't want lo-fi gaming to be is by the end of the game, by the end of the stream, by the end of the two hours or so, 
is this a lo-fi game, yes or no? What I want is I want the certainty where someone can go to the channel and go, I want to watch the lo-fi gaming playlist and know that, that is nothing but chill games. And at the end of the year, I'd love to put together some sort of compilation of here's my best game of this year. You know, here's my best game of this year. Here's the best game we played. Here's the best game we reviewed. Here's the best game we chilled out to. All this sort of stuff. Um, so, yeah. That's some of the games that you can expect to see on Lo-Fi Gaming. Uh, Focalorizing 899 also asks, uh, and will there be any other series in a similar kind of vein? It's really interesting you ask that question because you sort of, yes, basically. In short, yes. Um, so Smith's Myths came out of nowhere and I, that was a, it's been in my head for ages and all of a sudden um, two episodes were made and I would edited them and posted them and made shorts about them, all this sort of stuff and they gained traction and the people seemed to enjoy them. Uh, so yeah, Smith's Myths where basically I have always been interested in gaming creepypasta stories. So like, if you don't know what a creepypasta is, basically it's like an online folklore story where, you know, it's um, the, the videotape from The Ring or the, uh, oh god, what else am I thinking of? Um, the the Haunted Diary, that if you read it, a ghost comes back and gets you, that sort of thing. It's like, oh no, don't go into the woods, they're haunted, that sort of thing. So it's those sort of tales, but based on video games. So it's more a case of... Um, Either these games have been made because of creepypastas that people have posted, or these get, the creepypastas have inspired the games, or vice versa. The games have inspired the creepypastas. Either or. It started... What year are we in now? 2023? Was it? Eight years ago, let's say, when we, I first moved to Nottingham, um, and I had a job as a essentially data entry i wasn't data entry i was something else but for, for confidential reasons i'm gonna say data entry um and i spent some of my time on reddit as most data entry people do i still did my work don't get me wrong uh but i found the creepypasta and i found the uh, legend of zelda ocarina of time ben drowned creepypasta it's very famous if you if you don't know it, i recommend going and reading it if you like spooky stories looking back on it now it's a bit rubbish but it's obscure enough and creepy enough that you're just like, is this, is this, could this be real? Why is this? That's one of the reasons why I like things like the Sonic.exe story. How do, oh God. <laughs> um, and the Pokemon uh, Black Edition story. I don't, I'm not going to lie, I got a slight shiver then. Uh, which are the two first episodes of Smith Smiths. Um, and that title just came to me one afternoon. I was just like, huh, that's brilliant. And it is, and I like it. So, uh, yeah, it's got, they're just creepy enough to be like, they send a bit of a chill down your spine and you're like, I don't really want to know more about this, but I want to know more about this. It's the it's the haunted videotape from the ring, right? You don't want to watch it, but no one looked away when that bit was playing. <laughs> do, do you know what I mean? Because you're like, I'm fine with well, this is just a movie, right? And if you've watched the original Japanese version, it feels like a proper haunted videotape section. Like you just like, and I I think no, I didn't watch it on videotape. Thank God. When I first watched it, it was many, many years ago and I watched it on DVD, but that bit, the videotape bit, felt super duper haunted. And that's just fed that obsession, if that makes sense. So there's bits and pieces like that where I'm just like, ooh, this looks creepy, let's have a look at this. Now those episodes are probably going to be few and far between because one, sometimes, I mean, the, the Pokemon Black Edition one took me fucking days to record that this is... Bastard. I can't get through this because I haven't cut it down originally. You f f fucking. F Unless. Can I. No. No! No! <laughs> deep regret. Deep, deep regret. I'm even going to take the path and everything. I'm not even going to do anything weird and wonderful. Let's 
go. Uh, <laughs> absolutely days. The Sonic.exe one took me half an hour. Right. The Pokemon Black Edition one took me four days to record. And because I had to play through most of Pokemon. Uh, and that's not a small feat, especially when you have a day job, a social life, um, other things that you want to do in life, and other also other work responsibilities, like, you know, making a course for someone and doing videos for other people, that sort of thing. So they may be few and far between, but they are definitely a thing that I want to continue. Um, and screaming at a joypad is one of those ones that I'm just like, that used to be my moniker, that used to be sort of my nickname, not my nickname, my online screen name. And I don't really want that name to die, but I, I don't want just to be known as the Lo-Fi Gaming Man. I mean, that's a fine that's a fine title to have, but I, I like spooky games as well, hence why I play Phasmophobia, um, hence why you know there are some games on the Screaming at a Joypad list, so I think if people come and they want to see me freak out, they will watch uh, Screaming at a Joypad. If they want to learn about uh, creepy haunted games, they would go to Smith's Myths. If they want to go and chill out some gameplay, they would go to Lo-Fi Gaming. Um, so I want, I definitely want individual kind of labels on these, if that makes sense. Uh, but games that are coming up on Screaming at a Joypad, I've got a list of those as well that include, uh, Madison, uh, the Mortuary Assistant, uh, that's pretty much it at the minute. Uh, there's a couple of others, but I can't remember. There's, um... Yeah, I can't remember them. Uh, but hopefully that answers your question. And finally, Peripheral Echo Alpha asks, considering your plans for streaming, but also at the same time your plans for the real world, do you believe at all that you'll find a balance between work and streaming? Yes, but. <laughs> Not yes and, yes, but. Uh, yes, uh, Echo. Echo's always got really good questions like this, um, but always wants to make sure that I don't burn myself out. They're a very, very considerate human, and I appreciate them a lot for that. It's mainly, this is probably a good time to announce that Fridays are now going to be my dedicated streaming day. Fridays, 5pm British time, whether that's BST or GMT, till 7.30pm. So 5 till 7.30pm. Uh, yeah, so about two and a half hours on a Friday, you will definitely see me on twitch.tv forward slash peripheral mic and probably on this YouTube channel as well. Um, now, what that stream is going to be is a question mark. That's just going to be, I am going to stream for some time. Moving forward, hopefully not too slowly, I will find more time to do that. Uh, at the minute, it's a little more difficult, obviously because I've talked about work commitments in the past. My day job doesn't really get in the way. It's the peripheral media stuff. Now, I don't want to just abandon the peripheral media stuff and say, I don't want to do that. I want to do streaming because... The non-streaming stuff, so like the tech uh, courses that I do, I'm writing some stuff for some people at the moment, uh, that pays money and I, I genuinely appreciate that. And the um, gaming side of it and the streaming side of it, I'm not a partner on anything. I'm an affiliate, which means I get a little bit of money from Twitch, but that's not a lot. And that's not as much as I would get paid otherwise. So I'd like to do side work for, for money. I am money motivated. I can't escape that. That's the, coming from a working class background. I am money motivated. If there's money there, and you know, if, if someone says, "Can you do this thing you are uh, intimately an intimate specialist in for this amount of money?" I'll probably say yes. So that's the thing. When that thing is, can you stream for us for a certain amount of time per week for this much money? bonus <laughs> but until that happens it's going to be a case of fridays will be the stream day um moving forwards what i'd like to look at is i'd like to look at things like getting youtube partnership and getting twitch partnership i know i've said that doesn't really matter in the in the past i think that might just be my own fear of success who knows so i'm going to revisit that probably in a few weeks just to see if i still feel the same way about it and I think that's pretty much everything. Hopefully you've enjoyed this Q&A. If you do want to take part in the Q&A, then please, please join the Discord with the link down below. Um, and yeah, join the Discord and ask some questions. Like I said, what I'll probably be doing is changing this to a quarterly thing. Um, just because I don't want to force people to ask questions. So I'll probably have like a Q2 
and a Q3 and a Q4 and just keep them sort of open and when it's no longer the second quarter I'll then close that one and open the third quarter and do do videos as and when. That also takes a little bit of pressure off myself as well so I don't have to think oh no I've not got February's done. I've got between January and March to do the to collect the, the the videos to collect the questions for the video and then I'll do the video afterwards. So hopefully you've enjoyed this. Um yeah, let me know if you have or you haven't through the Discord, probably. There are going to be some changes on the channels coming uh, because I've been reevaluating some stuff based on certain personal developments, I guess. Like I said, fear of failure, fear of change, etc., etc. Um, but I will keep everyone as up to date as I can. Thanks so much for watching, everyone. Stay safe, and I'll see you next time.